want to welcome you to our Sunday school hour. And uh, it's a joy to be able to come to you and teach you this Lord's Day. I want to just remind you we're going to be doing some things between now and the end of the year. A lot of things have to do with uh, Operation Christmas Child. This coming Wednesday night, November the 3rd, we're going to be packing 250 boxes uh, for children all around the world. We've already given out 250 for people out of the church to do. But we're having a packing party on Wednesday night, and uh, it's open to anybody who wants to come. We'll be over in the gymnasium. Instead of our adult Bible study, we're going to be packing boxes, and uh, we're looking forward to that happening. And then November the 15th through the 22nd, morning and evening, we're going to be taking in shoe boxes from all over North Alabama. They'll be bringing them to our church. We are a collection center this year, and uh, we'll be doing that for that entire week. And then uh, after the week, we'll be loading those on a truck and taking them to a church down at Aniana that's in charge of getting them to Atlanta, to the warehouses. And uh, we're looking forward to doing that, and we're needing some volunteers if anybody's interested in that. And then on the 29th of November, we'll be traveling. That's on a Monday to uh, the warehouse in Atlanta to uh, work there for a whole day. And we've got 25 spots reserved. Anybody who would like to go, you can sign up. Uh, sign up sheets back here on our bulletin board in the fellowship hall. Well, let's go ahead and get started in our Sunday school lesson. We are in the book of Colossians. And this morning we're in Colossians chapter 2 verses 4 through 15. If you uh, have your Bible there at home, maybe you can turn to that, and we'll be looking at each one of those verses as we teach the Sunday school lesson. Before we begin, let's have a word of prayer today. Father, I thank you for an opportunity to study your word, and I pray you'll bless uh, this Lord's Day here at the church building at Sardis. Bless our services, bless our Sunday school. And Lord, I pray for those who are uh, shut in at home and who cannot come and who are listening today to the Sunday school lesson. I pray you'll bless that, bless us as we study together. In Jesus' name, amen. In Colossians chapter 2, we're going to be talking about the gospel's forgiveness. And uh, Colossians 2, 4 through 15, the Apostle Paul taught the church at Colossae to remain faithful to an authentic gospel message. He had help with the uh, starting of the church, and he wanted to keep them on track and he knew the dangers that churches have of straying away from the faithful gospel message. And he didn't want false teachers to come in and to draw them away. So we're going to talk about, first of all, some false thoughts. There were one time uh, back in history, there were Spanish sailors who discovered the Galapagos Islands. And they found on those islands so many tortoises that they named the islands after them. Galapago in Spanish is the word for tortoise. And uh, today, except for a few zoos around the world, and those islands are the only place that that particular breed of tortoises live. And you can find them only if you're looking in the right place. Now, in spiritual terms, when you think about that, in spiritual terms, God's forgiveness uh, is something we need to look at, and it works the same way. God makes it abundantly available to any person, but you have to be looking in the right place to find the forgiveness of God. More specifically, you have to be looking not just to the right place, but you have to be looking to the right person, the Lord Jesus Christ. So first of all today, let's understand the context. Look in chapter 2. I want to read the verses today. It's quite lengthy, but I want to read it, and then we'll explain the verses. Beginning in verse 4, it says, Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, as you've been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. You are complete in him who is the head of all principalities and powers. In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, 
by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Colossians chapter 2, verses 4 through 15. The second chapter of Colossians, we've been in the study several weeks now, but the second chapter of Colossians opened with Paul expressing concerns for the Colossian believers. He refers to that concern as a great struggle that's likely going on in the early church. And he's referring to the intensity of the prayers that he is praying for them. To his concern for the church, he's added intense desire for their encouragement and for unity to take place in the church. Those things are also important today for all of us to be encouraged in the Lord, in the church, and for all of us to be united in Him. Well, this week's passage opens with Paul stating the reason that he is concerned for the church. He doesn't want them to be uh, led astray by false teaching. He's become aware of false teachers who were seeking to deceive the Colossian believers in that early church with fine-sounding reasoning, things that sounded good, and with impressive rhetoric. They sounded good, and they used good words, but they were actually teaching false doctrine. So the efforts of the false teachers in their midst were aimed at leading those early believers away from the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, away from their convictions and the person and the work of the Lord Jesus. So Paul directed them in his letter to them to continue to follow Christ with gratitude that started from the very beginning of the church there and should have gone even to this day. And even though he was not physically present with them, Paul says he assured them he was with them in the spirit. He was with them in uh, deep concern. So being faithful to Christ and to the gospel meant being alert so as not to be taken in or captivated by false teachers uh, teaching things that were not based on the gospel. In our world today, there are a lot of teachers who are teaching things that are not according to the true gospel. The gospel is based on Christ's full deity and on his real humanity. He was all God, but he was also man. That's why he came to this earth. Paul insisted that those Colossian believers find their true identity in the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul continued by explaining that outward actions, what you do outwardly, do not lead to salvation. Salvation depends on what happens on the inside of you in the heart, rather than what might be done to the body. And he reminded them that Christian baptism, he moved from circumcision to baptism, and he says Christian baptism does not save you. It just gives an outward witness to what has already happened on the inside of you through saving faith. This faith in Jesus Christ brings salvation to those who trust him. Their salvation in none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. So Christ, through his death on the cross, erased our debt of sin, and in so doing, conquered all who seek to oppose believers or even claim them. So Paul wanted the Colossians, first of all, to remember that faith in Christ alone brings forgiveness, and it's the only thing that can bring victory in our lives. And then secondly, let's explore the text, verses 4 and 5. I already read those, so we won't read them again. But having just stated all that, that all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are securely located in the Lord Jesus Christ in verse 3, Paul begins to explain in verse 4 why he pointed out this truth. It was so that no one would deceive them. And the conclusion to be drawn from this concern to those early believers was 
in fact being confronted with false teachings that were taking place in that day. Now, apparently, these false teachings used enough vocabulary and enough ideas out of the truth gospel on the surface that it seemed like what they were teaching was something that was straight from God's Word. And there are teachers today who are doing essentially the same thing. They'll take a, a scripture out of the Bible and they'll start talking about that scripture, maybe even read that scripture. But they'll depart from the scripture and give things that it sounds like they're tied to that scripture, but they have nothing at all to do with the true text. The risk residing in these arguments was that the Colossians would stray away from the convictions about Christ that they had had instilled in them from the very beginning. Also, he had earlier commended them for the fact that the truth of the gospel had taken fruit in them since the day they heard it. Chapter 1 of Colossians, verse 6. And would they abandon the message of Christ's gracious truth in favor of persuasive words by men using false arguments? So Paul felt a spiritual kinship with the Colossians, even though he was not physically there with them, even from a distance, he rejoiced with them about their orderliness, about their strength of their faith in Christ. The expression rendered well-ordered was a military term that described a group of disciplined soldiers, and he was saying, I'm so thankful that you're like a group of disciplined soldiers in the Scripture. So don't leave that. Now, couple with it was his knowledge of the strength of their faith. So the res result of their life, Paul was saying to them, stay true in what you have been taught. As we might put it today, they had a true, firm grip on the truth of the gospel. The implication in this was that they had no reason to loosen that grip, no reason to quit believing what they had been taught and no reason to follow error in teaching. And then you get to verse 6, and he talks about not just standing in the truth, but walking in Him. So then, or on the basis of a genuine faith in Christ, whom they had received, Paul exhorted them to walk in Jesus, or to continue to hold on to the gospel as it had been presented to them. They began their Christian journey with the true doctrine. They had committed themselves to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, their walking implied they were progressing towards a destination. Becoming a Christian means receiving Christ, but being a Christian means living in fellowship with Christ and holding on to those beliefs. So he exhorted them not just to remember what they had been taught, but to walk in those beliefs. Then he calls him the Lord Jesus Christ. He called him Christ, and then he calls him Lord. And he reminded them of his sovereignty, that they owed to him their total loyalty because he was sufficient, and they didn't need any other thing. And then verse 7, not leaving the chance that the Colossian believers understand fully the depth of what it means to walk in Christ, Paul then gives them four phrases that uh, talks about walking in Christ. And he gives those beginning in verse 7. I want to just quickly give you those four phrases that Paul used, and I want you to see them. The first is the idea of rooted, an imagery drawn from a field of agriculture, like working out in the fields. Around our church this week, uh, they have been harvesting soybeans behind our church and the side of our church. Uh, the Rosses have been out there with their uh, cultivating material, and they have been uh, picking the beans this week. We had a little bit of excitement yesterday on uh, Wednesday. We had a little bit of excitement that uh, uh, they came rushing to the church with their combine, and they found out their combine was on fire. And uh, they pulled up beside the church, and they found a hose pipe at the back of the church, and they wet down the beans that were on fire, and they put out the fire. But that reminds me of this agriculture that is here uh, in these verses. And it talks about the root system. Uh, in our yard uh, where we live, there are some giant trees there. And on the ground, there are some dry, giant roots. 
And from those roots, those giant trees draw nourishment and support. And this reminds us of a blessed person. Like over in Psalm chapter 1, it says, He is like a tree planted beside the waters, of uh, the living waters of life, by flowing streams. And this participle is in the perfect tense, which suggests a completed action with ongoing implication. You are in Christ. You are standing in Him. You are walking in Him. You are rooted in Him. So continue to walk with Him. And then he moves on to the second phrase, and he says, built up in Him. Closely joined to that first term is now an architectural arena built up in Him. And it's talking about uh, a Christian life is continually being built. You never arrive as a Christian. You always continue to learn. I've been a Christian since I was 17 years of age. I've been preaching since I was 21. So I've been preaching and pastoring for over 40 years, and I'm still learning things from God's Word every single day. So when you think about that, you're built like a building, brick by brick, little by little. Reminds me of a song our preschoolers used to sing. He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. Uh, took him just a week to make the moon and the stars and Jupiter and Mars, but he's still working on me. And there's never a time while you're on this earth that he quits working on you. And then he gives the third phrase. He says, and established in the faith. The faith refers to the body of truth in which believers are being progressively established. You are continuing to grow and to mature. Being established suggests firmly anchored and immovable. So this truth is what the Colossians had been taught from the beginning of their Christian journey. So Paul is saying, once you've started out with, stay with that true gospel. And then the fourth phrase was, overflowing with gratitude. We are quickly approaching Thanksgiving season. There ought not ever be a day when you stop being thankful. And you ought to just sit down and write out the blessings that you have and thank God for them every day. So he says to those Colossian believers, you are rooted in the faith. You are being built up in him. You are being established in the faith. And you ought to be overflowing with gratitude. That's what Paul was saying to them. Then verses 8, 9, and 10, he comes to point number 3, be careful. Verse 8, having exhorted his readers to continue following Christ and the truth of the gospel, Paul says to them, be very careful, be very discerning, and don't be led away by philosophy and vain or empty deceit from this world. He sensed that some in the church were at the risk of being captured by false ideas that had no grounding in the truth of the gospel. In America today, uh, different ideas, different philosophies, and different uh, traditions and different beliefs are being thrown out to all of us. And I think the scripture would say to us, don't be caught up in philosophy and vain deceit but stay with the truth of the gospel. If understood as a term expressing a love for wisdom and philosophy, uh, then that's not an enemy of the gospel. But if it's something that changes the gospel, a false philosophy, then it is a serious enemy of the church. We've got some things going on in our world today that are serious enemies of the church. Uh, if you don't believe that, I dare you just to turn on the world news and see what kind of vain and empty philosophies being spewed out on the news in our world, even to the point of the liberal news media won't even present the real truth of what's happening in America today. Then he talks about don't be caught up in human tradition. Now, in his days, there were two, there were two things that were happening. One, there was oral tradition that was being taught by the Pharisees, things pertaining to the law, they had taken the Ten Commandments, ten simple little laws, and they had just kept on developing and developing and come up with over 600 laws, and they were doing oral traditions, and they were so caught up in that. Uh, the Pharisees believed that. The Sadducees did not believe that. And then on the other hand, there were some false teachings from the world 
that they were trying to follow. follow. So what he's asking is, why do you break God's commandment and want to follow either the traditions of the world or the traditions of those who are teaching in the name of religion? And then he added an indictment. Chapter 15, if you'll flip there just a moment in verse 6, says, you have nullified the word of God because of your tradition. I'm sure he would say to the church today, don't follow the traditions of the church if they go astray from the word of God. But in this text, he was talking about Jewish traditions and he was talking about pagan traditions. So in addition to a basis in human tradition, the false philosophy that was putting these Christian believers in danger was also based not just in religion, but in the elements of the world. And then you move on to verses 9 and 10. And a positive declaration about Christ's divine nature serves to render meaningless and unnecessary a system of belief about things which have nothing at all to do with God. So he's saying to them, stay true to the Word of God. Stay true to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Christians down through the ages have accurately believed and confessed the all-sufficiency of Christ as Savior and Lord. And Jesus Christ fully meets our spiritual need. We don't need anything else. And that's what Paul is teaching. Then he comes to verses 11 through 15 to close out this section of the Scripture. And he talks about remember by means of the rite of circumcision, and he talks about that uh, physical circumcision that was true in the Old Testament, and then he brings it over into the Bible days where Jesus was living, and he talks about spiritual circumcision. The former was the circumcision of the body. The latter is the circumcision of the heart, where your heart is purged from sin. And the fact that this topic had to be addressed, reveals there was a Jewish component to the false teaching, threatening the Christian church, a truth that becomes apparent later on in the book. So the physical circumcision of the old covenant is contrasted with the Messiah's spiritual circumcision. And then to come down to the end of the chapter, he moves from circumcision and he talks about baptism, the immersion of a believer in baptismal water. And that symbolizes what Paul termed as being buried with him, buried with Christ in baptism. And this act of baptism gives witness to a repentant sinner's faith in an identification with Christ's crucifixion. Now, baptism never saved anyone. You can be baptized as many times and as many places as you want to be, and that will not save you. Baptism shows that we have died to our old way of life and we're rising up out of the water to walk in a newness of life. And then verses 13, 14, and 15, Paul explained to the Colossians their need for the new life God had worked in them was because they were dead in trespasses. So when you get saved, God forgives you. You are dead to that old life. You are dead to your sins and dead in trespasses. And because of that, you put on the Lord Jesus Christ. God's action in response to saving faith is that he makes us spiritually dead alive with Christ, and in so doing, he forgives all our trespasses. Notice here he talks about the debt that was against us. Christ has moved that debt out of the way. What a wonderful thing to think about when you get saved, when you ask the Lord to save you, the Lord Jesus takes all those sins and he removes them. The Bible says as far as the east is from the west. The Bible says he throws them behind his back and he can never see them again. The Bible says he plants them in the depths of the sea and they are gone forever. So Paul is saying to the church, stay true to the gospel He forgave your sins, past, present, and future. They are gone forever. Don't let anybody come and deceive you with false doctrine. And I would just say an amen to Brother Paul and an amen for the church to listen today. Don't be carried away with every wind of doctrine. Stay with the truth of God's Word. 
believe the gospel, stand in it, walk firm in it, trust that the Lord has removed your sin debt, and you stand righteous not because of you, but because of the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want to ask you to forgive me. I was supposed to be teaching a Sunday school lesson, and I just preached a message. Amen. Thank you, and God bless you, and I hope you enjoyed the teaching today. And I hope you'll tune in today for our worship service in just a few moments. Thank you, and God bless you.